start my talk. With, uh, with a personal journey to elaborate uh, on the nature of health and its corollaries. I trained in uh, medicine for over 10 years in uh, the hospital system. And uh, when I left there, I felt that I was really well versed uh, dealing with um, uh, all the different diseases that I had seen across all the different uh, departments. And uh, that there would be very little in the way for me to uh, go on and um, uh, work equally successfully in um, general practice. But what then happened uh, was in my first day, uh, I saw about uh, 20 patients uh, through uh, the whole of the day and uh, I couldn't find anything wrong with the patients. And I went to my boss and said, uh, well, uh, it's okay with me if you uh, sack me on the spot. I, uh, I think uh, I stuffed it all up. I couldn't find anything wrong uh, with anyone. And he sort of in, in his uh, very gentle but um, uh, affirmative way said, sit down. And he had a two-sentence two lecture for me. He said, I don't need to sack you. You haven't done anything wrong. And, uh, what you did is right. Remember, you are not working in a hospital anymore. Patients that come to general practice are here to, ex to explore their disease, their suffering, their illness, and they need full attention from you for that task. And it was only much later uh, that I came to realize uh, what kind of an insight uh, he was embarking uh, to me. Uh, it took five years um, when I was, had sort of a personal professional crisis um, and uh, was sort of at the point, do I stay in medicine or do something else, um, that I became aware of my complete ignorance about what is the role of the doctor in general and uh, health and health seeking in particular. And that was a point in time when uh, I then started uh, to develop an academic interest uh, and uh, looked at these kind of challenges. And one of the uh, issues uh, that came out of it is uh, that uh, this particular talk. The difference that my supervisor talked about um, is something uh, that one can summarize in the way that Osler did it. Uh, it is more important to know what patient has the disease than what disease the patient has. And it's not really new to either because he essentially um, went back to uh, Hippocratic uh, notions uh, that uh, it is all about the whole of the patient rather than the sum of the body parts. And the task of medicine really is to understand and treat the whole of the person in his intricate uh, context, a point uh, I'm coming back to uh, in a moment. But first, I think we need to consider the meaning of dis and distinctions between the terms we use. And we do so very differently um, in different languages. And um, it's quite unique that the English language has at least three, maybe four terms to describe what's going on. Health, illness, disease, and sickness. I left sickness out of it. From my, my German knowledge, I know there are only two words. Um, uh, in Spanish, this is what uh, got transferred to me. Uh, someone may want to elaborate later on it. Uh, and the Greek equally have essentially only uh, two terms about uh, the state uh, of affairs. I think word mat matters. Uh, they provide powerful and lasting images about uh, what's going on. Uh, and as uh, Kipling uh, said, words are, of course, the most powerful drug used by mankind. Uh, words provoke visual images. Uh, and if you think about terms like health syst uh, system, most see images like this, an emergency department, theaters or operating rooms, uh, hospital wards, or if you take it towards uh, healthcare providers, you see doctors, nurses, dentists, others. I think it's interesting um, uh, to take another step back and look where do these terminologies all come from. Uh, health is an old English word meaning um, whole, wholeness. Uh, Disease actually is a word that is a, a combined of two parts. Dis, meaning um, uh, without, and ease, 
uh, being ease, without ease, uh, being in discomfort, being inconvenienced, being in distress. Contrast that to uh, what science is about, uh, the, 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 the pathology meaning uh, behind medical sciences. Um, historically, it was um, Rokotansky who combined the clinical information uh, before we were able to see what, what is going on, and it's known as uh, clinical pathological correlation. And more or less at the same time, the discovery of technology uh, that was alluded to uh, in the discussion allowed us to see for the first time causative re reasons uh, for the development uh, of of the diseases of the time, which were largely infectious diseases, and uh, Koch's formulation of the germ th uh, theory of disease. In a way, the shift from the subjective to the objective is not really a new concept either. It already had happened uh, in the old time between the school of course and the uh, Canadian uh, perspective. Uh, sorry, there's, there's a mistake uh, in the labeling here. Uh, that we can deal in medicine with the diseases or we can deal with a person. Uh, and historically, uh, the, the school, of course, was uh, the more relevant uh, one and has shaped uh, medicine for about 2,000 years before we had technology to uh, uh, make a shift to it. I've looked at lots of definitions of um, uh, health over time. And uh, uh, time allows only to uh, let you, uh, to share with you some of them. Uh, Plato put it as health as an application to human nature in all its parts, operations, levels, and dimensions. The psychological, uh, the physical, the psychological, social, and the spiritual. Husserl um, uh, came from a slightly different perspective, uh, seeing health uh, is a holistic ability to relate properly to and function well in the whole life world in all its aspects and disease or disturbance of this ability on any of uh, a variety of levels or in any of a variety of dimensions. Maslow uh, contributed, ultimately health is obtained through self-realization. Man must search for meanings on his own grounds and live in accordance with his own values, skills and free dispositions. Uh, Illich, whom I really like very much uh, from um, uh, his perspective, held to the positive state that dynamically spans across the stages of life, the ability to adapt to changing environments, to growing up and to aging, to healing when damaged, to suffering and to the peaceful expectation of death. The sense of coherence notion um, uh, was put forward by uh, Antonovsky. Uh, who sees uh, coherence as a global orientation that expresses the extent to which one has a pervasive, enduring, though dynamic feeling of confidence that one's internal and external environments are predictable. And uh, the final uh, one comes from uh, Ingstedt, uh, who has worked um, in the Kalahari uh, desert uh, for a long while, and she conveys what uh, she observed as uh, the experience of the Kalahari people. Uh, health depends uh, on many interconnected aspects of life, belonging to one's local environment or land, the sense of freedom, culture and spiritual belonging, and the sense of dignity and uh, uh, security. It's a notion that is uh, uh, quite an important one for uh, almost all indigenous uh, people around the world and is uh, a source of uh, their poor health. I think what happens is that all of these um, uh, uh, contributions add something, but that still, in my view, don't uh, contribute um, a, a complete picture of it. The one in interesting thing is that uh, from an experiential point of view, and all of these definitions have an uh, a strong experiential component to it, is that uh, disease as such doesn't exist. It's only the experience uh, of it that, uh, as Per Fugeli uh, has put it. Uh, I think.
Okay. The, my background is from uh, systems and complexity sciences, and uh, I think I need to briefly at least share with you uh, complex adaptive um, uh, systems, uh, what they are. Uh, as a picture uh, shows, that it, uh, a complex adaptive system is made up out of uh, agents that are linked uh, in a network fashion, and they are bounded from uh, other uh, things around it. Uh, the interactions between the agents in the system uh, are what leads to the emergent behavior of a system. And uh, what you usually find is that uh, the interactions lead to um, uh, feedback loops that then can either in, the, in their actions be reinforcing and lead to a vicious cycle, or they can be self-stabilizing uh, to maintain the function of the system within uh, limits. The important message is that systems behavior is non-deterministic. Uh, uh, that means the outcomes never can be uh, precisely predicted. That led uh, me to um, uh, develop this model of um, the biocycle socio-semiotic model of health, where uh, health in the end becomes a balance between your experiences in your, in, in your different domains, uh, the biological, the psychological, the social, uh, and the cognitive or semiotic. Health exists when there is a balance between these uh, uh, features and how that can play out is that it, it can be completely independent of the biological component uh, of the person uh, as is uh, exemplified uh, in, in this picture where the, the chap on the left hand side um, has quite severe heart failure but uh, experiences good health because he's uh, psychologically um, um, optimistic, he has good uh, social support, and his illness has made sense to him. Uh, uh, whereas another person with the same incident, uh, without having sustained damage to his heart, uh, uh, and who is unable to uh, come to terms with it, experiences uh, uh, this ease uh, that uh, then uh, creates all the other associated problems that, uh, as clinicians, we are aware of anxiety, social um, uh, and uh, loss and uh, constraints. If you see that health is a dynamic feature that you feel differently hour by hour, day by day, you can plot it in uh, the way illustrated here. Um, uh, and if you then flatten this, you get what um, uh, we uh, uh, see as patterns and understand as patterns. We know that certain people with a chronic disease um, uh, commonly talk about their physical limitations, uh, whereas uh, people uh, who have an acute illness are normally within the balanced state and uh, occasionally um, uh, have a few days where the acute illness uh, makes them unwell and then they return back to the healthy state. Or you can have, as in the right bottom picture, someone uh, with uh, somatization uh, who is swinging extremely between uh, two different states. Uh, in the end, one has to ask uh, who is healthy and who is not. Is a child healthy? Is uh, a child affected by Down syndrome healthy? Is a depressed executive healthy or not healthy? What about a wheelchair-bound person, a blind person, someone uh, disabled by uh, osteoarthritis, or even a dying person? I had a patient who a week before she died said to me, I know I'm going to die, but tell me why I'm feeling so healthy. Uh, so it's not a paradox uh, uh, at all. People can make uh, positive health experience even uh, in uh, rather dramatic uh, situations. Okay, let me challenge you uh, a bit further by briefly outlining a number of uh, uh, aspects that that uh, come from some of my research uh, colleagues and fr uh, friends. Uh, one is from uh, uh, Hannes Bircher and um, uh, Kuruvilla who pointed out that health is achieved when the biologically given potential 
and the personally acquired potential uh, are sufficient to meet the demands of lives. Uh, this has just been published. If you're interested, uh, you can read that up. And this notion very much fits with uh, what Stephen Lewis had pointed out uh, from a um, biology background, that health is the prerequisite for survival. It's, it's about the struggle for life. And even more challenging uh, is Stefan Topolsky's um, uh, work. Uh, he has gone back to first principles, uh, which relates very much to the somatopsychosocial semiotic notion of health uh, as a balanced state. That we know that over lifetime, your different abilities do all turn uh, in a nonlinear way. That's why you have the long tail distribution. And what from a theoretical point of view, he constructed is what you see in the dotted line, uh, the health potential curve over life. And what became remarkable is if you do take the inverse of that, uh, then health uh, or mortality becomes the inverse of, of health. If you look at mortality data, they actually are the flip of this uh, curve. And what he proposes is that um, uh, which fits with, with the other notions that I mentioned, that if health is a struggle for survival, or mortality data actually uh, do reflect that uh, in terms of health experience. And what finally came out of it is a proposition for a new definition of health. It's not as um, uh, easily memorable as a WHO uh, pro uh, proposition, uh, but it uh, uh, tries to combine all these different uh, notions that I alluded to um, in a way. Uh, and it reads then, human health is a balanced state between physical, emotional, social, and cognitive sense-making domains. Within any local environmental context, a health state exists within a multidimensional phase space of physical integrity, functional performance, and subjective experience, producing an entropic state most consistent with viability. That's a mouthful, uh, and it probably uh, will uh, require um, uh, reading a few times and thinking about um, uh, the different uh, aspects, uh, but to the best of our ability, um, uh, we, we try to um, pull together um, uh, all that we could uh, think of and could elaborate from uh, the literature about uh, the, the notion of and, and, and the function of health. And in a final slide, uh, we try to uh, uh, visualize uh, this uh, to make... Uh, the idea behind it is that you are born with a particular potential. Within a framework, it doesn't really matter whether you have a little bit or not a little bit. It's as long as it is um, sufficient to live healthy, productive uh, uh, life, there's no problem. And then there comes a time when you use up your um, uh, state and your entropy increases, um, that it becomes, you become brittle. Uh, and if you have used up too much of it, then that is the end. And in many ways, what contributes to your composition of cells can be uh, related to any of the three uh, main dimensions uh, of health. And some people can be in good physical health but can't cope emotionally. Uh, if the emotional component uh, becomes uh, too severe, uh, then that's not compatible with life and you die even though there's no other particular reason for it. Uh, again, um, uh, that has been written up but not, not uh, widely distributed. Uh, if people are interested in it, I'm more than happy to, to share uh, that uh, paper with everyone. Thank you very much. That's really difficult because I put, pr produced the longest abstract. Well, I'll try to say we're, this is the joint agreement with Professor Mandrew Miles, so please. I was, I was just going to explain that I went home for my father's funeral and I misread the number of words on the abstract. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to talk about something empirical and um, I'm talking about uh, an attempt to operationalise um, self-rated health. And self-rated health, this is, this is health. Self-rated health, as you all know, 
came out of the RAND Corporation uh, survey um, and it's been used as a question in most countries around the world in longitudinal studies and it's a very simple question in general how do you rate your health and um, in fact I've added a very poor it's normally only up to poor and you've all heard about it it's very simple no one can believe um, that it has any meaning because it's so subjective and uh, in my era anything subjective was considered just really bad news in, in medical practice you know oh it's only subjective we'll have to validate that with an objective measure however self-rated health in epidemiological studies is a more valid and powerful predictor of morbidity and mortality than any other combination of objective or self-reported measures across international adult, adolescent, aged cohort studies. So it's a very robust measure. And just to demonstrate that, um, there's an increasing interest in it. This is self-rated health studies in epidemiology in cohort studies. And the number of publications per year since 1979 is rising uh, linearly. So. And more recently, all the um, omics and bioomics and epi epigenomics um, uh, have started to get into it because no one can really explain it in terms of our current disease model, our cu cur current objective measures. So self-rated health predicts major health outcomes. Its underpinnings vary from person to person. So if you ask me why I rate my health a certain way, and you ask someone else, they probably say something different. And when they ask Korean adults and Norwegian adults and elderly people somewhere else, their, their, their reasons for rating would be different. However, the features are that they seem to be cohort related. So you seem to compare yourself to your peers, even though you don't know the peers are answering the same question, but it's some sort of a cohort related expected versus self-assessment. So you have, seems to be there's some notion of what you should be like and how you assess yourself in relation to this notion. Despite there being differences, there are more commonalities than differences in determinants across national samples. So there's been a lot of epidemiological work looking at, well, what are the determinants? You know, it's poverty, it's all the usual things. It's the allostatic load. It's the, the you know, the poorer you are, the more diseases you have, um, the neighbourhood, all those things, all tend to predict that the average uh, within the cohort, there'll be more people with worse self-rated health. But there is, it's, it tends to be though within a cohort that it's very predictive compared to people in a particular cohort. So even in the worst neighbourhoods, those with the worst self-rated health will do the worst. So factors influencing in an individual health interact in complex ways that evade reductionist methods, assessing the parts. And it, it, what it does is it just turns out to be some global self-perception of health. Now there's been a lot of literature, and I'm not going into it, and, and social science and medicine and discussion about it as being, um, it's a personal health perception uh, representing an individual's unique access to their own bodily sensations and their meanings. So somehow or other, we sort of, we can listen to ourselves. We listen to our own bodies and work out how our health is. And um, if you look at us in terms of evolutionary survival, of course this is, a, this is a phenomenon we keep forgetting. We think that patients are these passive people that we have to apply a scientific method to. And here we've got pa patients are very active. They actually know. They know how well they are. Um, and we've now got theories, uh, and, and, and um, we're trying to sort of have a theory of everything. Um, and it appears that, you know, we know there are all the disappointment about the genome, but now we've got the epigenome and the exposome, which is really like, the, the, your genome and then how your genome um, is translated and what things you're exposed to and, and how there are different markers in the body that, that can actually uh, help you 
make sense of this. And there's external influences and internal influences. And Arkham has sort of talked about this, so I won't go too much into it. Just to say that this is a, an emergent phenomena. It's complex. Um, it's not unpredictable because people that tend to be in worse situations are likely to have worse self-aided health. But the cause and effect are organic. Non-linear patterns are only coherent in retrospect and non-repeating. But it's understandable. There's some degree of knowableness about it. There's a bit of chaos. You can't predict if someone's going to have a fall. You can only predict they're likely to have a fall. However, there's been little application uh, in clinical practice. There's a less certain role because we've been very much guided by objectivity. And then the opposite is intuition, judgment. But there's never been a recognition of the subjective assessment of health by individuals in real clinical practice. Does it actually add anything or is it just an epidemiological curiosity that's, that's really exciting but, you know, uh, so, does it help in clinical practice? So here we have a 78-year-old smoker with lots of things wrong with them. They're feeling terrible, but when you ask them about their self-rated health, they say they're fair, they've got all these problems, and what does this mean? Does this mean anything if you say, in general, how would you rate your health? And they say fair, what does that mean? So I've conducted a pragmatic clinical study uh, in Ireland to avert deteriorations in um, patients who are unstable, people who are at the end of life when, they're, when they're, um, their ability to, uh, their resilience is deteriorate. These are the people that everyone's talking about, those who are readmitted, the readmission patients that have become very much under the gaze of the policy makers internationally. How dare these people get readmitted and deteriorated and what are you doing out there? What should you be doing? So, and this was in a sense going against the grain of everyone having these, um, you know, wearable blood pressure machines and multiple gadgets and beeps in the home and like the UK whole of system demonstrator, which thank goodness <laughs> wasn't cost effective and the outcomes weren't really very exciting. So um, using a person-centered approach, um, and my experience in primary care is that the people who really know patients better than me as a doctor are the people at the front line, are the receptionists. They're the ones who know. They actually hear all these stories. So why not train these people up to call these high-risk people um, and, and follow them and see what happens? And so I've got a lot of publications on this, including all the background, and this, this has been very sort of loads and loads and loads of thoughts on it. But anyway, now there's the outcome papers. So I'll just tell you a little bit about it. Um, the aim was to prevent emergency department visits and hospital admissions. And it was two, 2011 to 2013, people with high probability of readmission scores um, were recruited from primary care. There are regular phone calls from care guides two to three times a week. We actually had more than that. We had 12,000 plus calls of 199 patients, average age of 76, and followed up for an average of about um, 10 months. A number of them died. Some of them went into nursing homes. There was a dropout, but some of them stayed on. So the question is, well, what happens? What is, if you're going back to my clinical scenario, what does that self-rated health is fair in the midst of all these other clinical information? Does it mean anything? Um, in fact, if you look at it, um, and these is real, these are months, and this is the real journey, this is patient one, and at this point I've picked a, a poor. You can see this person has a poor reading, and um, then they seem to stabilise. They're going up and down and then they stabilise. Um, and this person has two pores but their, their health is going down. So what does, so, this, so really you'd say, well, self-rated health isn't a very good predictor because you know, people are fluctuating all over the place. But when you actually look at the whole database, you'd find that there's a very high correlation with poor self-rated health and hospitalization going to the emergency department. And 
those who, on the days that these people reported, not the individuals, but the days they reported good health, there were very few admissions, very few visits to the emergency department and visits to the GP. So it's highly correlated with people's status. Um, and now, does it predict? Yes, it is a very strong predictor with other non-specific symptoms. On its own, it wasn't entirely predictive, but it was connected to um, other non-specific symptoms, malaise, weakness, tiredness, but not serious disease symptoms. So here we are, we've got multimorbidity, and everyone's asking us to look at all these disease symptoms. But in fact, in these patients who are all multimorbidity, it's non-specific. The deterioration before the deterioration to whatever, the heart failure or whatever, is non-specific. So, um, so it is useful because self-rated health gives you a good idea of this person's risk. Um, and if you look at the literature that's been referred to already, inflammatory states represent reduced resilience. And if you look at the literature, they may deteriorate into patterns of heart failure, pneumonia, and other conditions. So therefore, taking note of self-rated health, non-specific health experiences, you can say narratives here because I've got a whole other piece of this study where we actually looked at the narratives and that adds a lot more value, contributed to averting deteriorations. However, even in my own case, self-rated health signals from the individual are drowned out in professional constructs of disease in modern healthcare setting. Even in my own practice, what was I going to do with the self-rated health? But it's, so it's an emergent health barometer in unstable journeys in clinical care. Person-centered healthcare should engage with and utilize it and other self-rated health perceptions to understand a person's self. Further transdisciplinary research linking omics and multiple potential biomarkers with self-rated health and multiple human and narrative perspectives is implicated. And this is listening to the person, but self-rated health is a very interesting summary marker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Okay, I skipped that. Uh, just as a reminder, we talked about health as a const uh, construct um, uh, that forms patterns over time. And what community epidemiology has shown uh, is that in the community, the health experience and the need for care f follow an, an 80-20 uh, rule or the Pareto distribution. 80% of all people are either in, in no disease state or have health issues that they feel are not requiring any uh, medical intervention. Leaves you with 20% of the community. Out of that 20%, 80% have something that rise, requires an explanation, an exploration, and uh, uh, primary care deals with that. Leaves you with 20%, which is 4% of the total community, that requires secondary care. Out of that, 80% again is something disease-specific uh, care, someone needs an operation or needs a cardiac catheter, leaves you with 0.8% uh, of the community that ends up uh, in uh, tertiary hospitals. This is another way of looking at it. People in the community uh, spend uh, 26,407.8 days or 72.35 years in the community without any uh, much medical attention, 59.5 days in uh, short-stay hospitals and 832.2 uh, days or 2.28 years in a nursing home. Uh, generally speaking, we are healthy and, and, and functioning quite well. The status quo though is that the healthcare system as we experience at this point in time is completely disease-focused and at the same time follows an economic uh, rationalist paradigm where the provision of health care on the one hand counts to GDP. The more you do, the better for GDP. But at the same time uh, is then the complaint, uh, you are doing too much, you're using up too much of uh, uh, the GDP. If you take another look uh, at um, uh, community figures, in the first uh, 50 to 60 years of uh, your life, there's very little need for medical care um, uh, other than some acute um, uh, or minor uh, illnesses. 
and it's only in, this, in, in, in the latter part that you, are incre that you increase uh, the number of chronic diseases uh, that require more medical attention. But what I found interesting in that slide is that in the uh, light blue area, most people with chronic illnesses, um, and that's based on disease-specific, um, uh, uh, so pathology-specific um, uh, issues, have only one or two. And the catastrophic one, which is a very thin line um, uh, before the gray, indicating death, uh, is rather um, a, a small part and really reflects um, in, in a different way the 80-20 rule. Uh, and if you then look at the spending pattern, it's 60% of the spending uh, on healthcare goes to people over 65. And in the last year of life, um, you use up, even when you are old, um, uh, five times more uh, resources in your last 12 months of life if you are under um, uh, 85 and three times more when you're over um, uh, 85. I think uh, that should uh, really uh, open people's eye, eyes that we are spending a lot of money for things that in the end become futile and uh, it becomes uh, uh, really a philosophical um, uh, uh, discussion that we need across whole community. It's not a, a thing that um, just is an issue for doctors to discuss. This is, needs to be something that the community at large uh, gets engaged uh, in. So, in a way, again, we come back to uh, what Osla said. It's about the person. We can skip that. What I want to add here on in terms of um, how system functions is that systems require a core driver or a core value that uh, uh, helps the system to focus and uh, let the self-organization of, of structure and function uh, uh, happen and uh, deliver the emergent behavior that comes out of it. Uh, and as I said earlier, the important thing is we can gauge a direction but we cannot be prescriptive. So people seek health care when they feel in disease. We know statistically um, uh, from epidemiological studies, most of the ones that seek health uh, care do not have pathological uh, states that require um, uh, uh, biomedical input in which we have been trained for uh, all the time. And this is a very interesting study coming from um, uh, the poorest suburb uh, in Sydney where a health development project was done and what came out of it is that people said fix the potholes. That was the highest priority for their health. And then came community development um, uh, with all the different uh, aspects of it. And only then came health delivery issues. So clearly a lot of people feel that there are other aspects that need to be addressed to improve their health and well-being other than uh, more doctorly services. There is a notion of simple rules uh, that uh, are one of the um, uh, core principles for uh, the function of uh, complex adaptive systems. And uh, usually you have uh, three, you, you never have uh, more than five. And these simple rules provide an operational framework for how the interactions of the agents in the system um, uh, should function. These core values have two functions. On the one hand, they provide the freedom for the agents to do what needs to be done. At the other, they provide a constraint not to go um, uh, outside of those. And this work uh, has been a collaborative work um, with uh, Carmel, who is here, and uh, Dio Halloran, um, uh, who can't be here. Uh, we, we brainstormed about it and tested it um, uh, with colleagues, and uh, this is sort of S somewhat of a consensus statement that some of the rules could be understand the patient's needs, develop ongoing relationships of trust between patients and their key providers, consider and understand the patient's context before delving into detail, explore the effects of your intended actions on other agents in the system, and consider delays between actions and outcomes. Uh, this, I think, is a very important one. Uh, systems take time uh, and uh, the, the cause and effect uh, behavior we have been trained in is really quite bad. To 
sort of help you to understand system dynamics a bit better. And uh, Capra suggested uh, uh, the vortex as a metaphor to understanding uh, complex adaptive systems. And we have taken uh, that forward. Uh, and what you can think about uh, is that the organizational notions of the m uh, macro, meso, micro, and nano levels uh, can be placed into uh, the healthcare vortex. Given what I said, if the, the, the core driver um, is uh, the personal experience of health of the patient, then on a, on a uh, micro level, the practice with all its uh, agents uh, usually has a good uh, understanding of uh, what needs to be done in all contexts uh, for the patients we look after. I call these people healthcare professionals in inverted commas because we know that uh, dealing uh, with issues of education, uh, safe work, having transport, um, uh, having uh, uh, good housing are all important parts of uh, maintaining health. Uh, and within the construct, it is a policy level that then uh, has a responsibility of coordinating between the different uh, agents in, on the policy uh, level uh, as well as having the responsibility to uh, provide the required resources. What can we expect uh, from, a, from a system that f focuses on um, uh, health rather than disease? Better health experiences from the patients, improved access, equity and respect and empowerment, uh, the capacity in health professional teams to provide person-centered, continuing and coordinated care for individuals and groups, appropriate community health services for minority and at-risk populations, and uh, coordinated cross-portfolio preventive services that ensure that people do not end up needing um, uh, the high-tech services that we are so good at in the right circumstances, but my view is we ab often abuse it. So the core driver should be need of the patient. That becomes the attractor of a health-focused health system. And if everyone thinks about what are the needs of the patient, the people are right in the system. The instructions for them to act are the wrong ones because they are focused on uh, specific diseases and on economics. And in that sense, I think we are in very good company. Um, uh, Rudolf Virko put it already in the 1850s. Uh, medicine is a so social science and politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. Uh, it is medicine as a social science, as a science of human beings uh, that has the obligation to point out problems and to attend their theoretical solution. The politician, the practical anthropologist must find the means for their uh, actual solution. And we have a responsibility uh, to be part of it. Just to preempt, because that is usually what you hear when, when uh, you propose um, a focus on something else, is that it's economically not doable. But we are confronted with a bean count as a microeconomic uh, perspective, uh, and, uh, that it all is too expensive. If you take the macroeconomic perspective, uh, I think that changes the whole picture, because <coughs> there you look at, this is my total pot, how do, do I distribute it? And it becomes a redistributive um, uh, uh, argument where more investment in the social infrastructure that keeps people healthy um, will decrease the need of spending. And I can't go into uh, details, but uh, more than happy to discuss later. And there are two examples that I'm aware of uh, where exactly the theoretical framework has been translated um, uh, uh, into action independent of the theoretical notion, uh, I have to say. One is the Somerville project uh, in Boston, uh, which uh, looked at school kids and uh, their health. The other one uh, is one I just came across uh, a few weeks ago at the Geneva Health Forum, uh, where uh, the focus was on dealing with the dying of AIDS patients in the slums of Nairobi, uh, and that has been the catalyst. What do these people need that then uh, in, engage them in looking on not only on AIDS death but also on AIDS prevention, AIDS treatment, uh, tuberculosis treatment, malaria, and now maternal and child health. Thank you very much. So actually, oops, I'm not going to talk about Pellegrino. For some reason, his name was put up there, uh, I guess because um, I did my uh, doctoral uh, dissertation with him. 
Uh, but I actually was going to look at something um, on the question of personal or personalistic, person-centered healthcare, according more to the Catholic tradition, I guess, obvious, coming <laughs> as a priest. Um, it's actually, I find it very interesting uh, listening to these talks um, that maybe there's um, something that when I did my dissertation, uh, I looked at the history of um, medicine, history of healthcare delivery, and there's certain um, things that are not very well known, not very well known um, in that um, the whole healthcare system, in some way, it came from, I guess, organized way, um, and medicine came from the Western contribution, especially through the, the Christian um, contribution. The hospitals, you know, um, in the early days were mostly monasteries, um, and also the, um, the doctors and nurses, mostly they were clerics and priests and monks taking care of the sick. In the old days, I mean, that's how you have um, um, health care being delivered. Um, and it's even in the first, uh, I guess, in the Middle Ages, when medicine, be medicine became organized, when you start to have hospitals and um, medical schools, um, we also know that that actually uh, came from the, the, the Catholic Church. So there's a, a great contribution uh, from the Christian West to the present day uh, system of uh, healthcare delivery. Um, one of the things that we've been looking into is um, how we have this different levels of um, healthcare being, I mean, you have the big system and then you have the healthcare providers and then the patients. And they're all important in this system of healthcare delivery. And once again, we talk about person-centered um, uh, approaches. So we are talking about mostly the patient as uh, the person. Um, even that uh, is a book written by Paul Ramsey. Um, and then how does that translate into the, uh, the way that the providers have to look, you know, relate to that patient or every individual patient as a person and how the system in some way can um, address the needs of these patients through the providers. I mean, this, this is a big topic, obviously, I, uh, you cannot um, go into it. Um, in the Catholic tradition, um, it's also interesting that uh, all these definitions of health that we heard about, um, the origin of the word health in both Greek and Latin, actually, salus in Latin, which is uh, the one that we all know, actually, uh, there's no distinction between the word uh, health and that which is physical health and spiritual health. Okay, salus also means salvation. Um, so sometimes, even in, in the Bible, in the Gospel, when Jesus heals someone, that's, that's why sometimes you, you have this wonder, right? why, why would he heal someone and say, you are saved, right? So it, because it's the same word, that you are healed, also means that you are saved. So it's, the two are very, it actually has no difference in actually in the biblical vision, health is not divided into the, the, the physical dimension and the, the uh, spiritual dimension. So that's important for us also to um, think about when you try to look, up, look at the person-centered uh, approach. Uh, how much do we want to bring in the spiritual dimension of, um, of health? Actually, there's a Peregrino wrote um, in one of his books, uh, a very interesting uh, part, I think, I, I forgot which book it was, and he talked about um, that uh, in the Middle Ages, the patients, before they get treated by the doctors, um, they need to go to confession. Okay, they need to go to confession before they are allowed to be treated by the doctors. So that's actually very interesting for for us today. It's totally foreign. It's a good idea. Yeah, <laughs> because uh, the idea is that if you are a sinner, if you're in sin, even though you are cured physically, saved, healed physically, that's the worst thing that could happen to you. Because you, you, you might be healed, but then you, you are. And also, they, there's also the conception that if you're not healed spiritually, God might not give you 
the healing physically. So that's the, um, the Middle Ages. Um, once again, this is, sorry, this is the famous person in the center that um, <laughs> some of you have uh, was a similar diagram. Um, here, I think the Catholic vision also look um, at the person as the center, but in a different way. It's more, much more holistic. Um, they're not different parts uh, of the person they try, you, they try to split up. Um, I think from listening to the different talks, there seems, at least to me, uh, something very interesting that could be from the historical, philosophical upbringing, a background from different people from different um, positions. That I sense that there is a uh, an Anglo-Saxon approach to personhood that that is much more uh, legal oriented and perhaps. Um, mo it's hard to put the word for it, right? Whereas the continental or the European emphasis on person is much more holistic or uh, I guess more continental philosophy. So I, I sense that, um, that when I heard some speakers talking about now um, that he quoted one author of uh, personalism in bioethics um, and he said he couldn't find any other uh, works written about personalism in biotics, I realized that, wow. <laughs> For me, um, our, um, our school in Rome is basically, and also a lot of schools in Italy are based on what we call personalistic bioethics. So that's just the main focus of biotics that we approach and the um, one of the authors, one of the proponents of personalistic bioethics, according to the Catholic tradition, is Cardinal Elio Screccia, an Italian priest, Cardinal, uh, who wrote actually a big volume in Italian just recently um, translated into English called Personalistic Bioethics. I mean, that's the name of the, the book. So you can tell um, there is maybe, I think, I think it would be very interesting to uh, have this encounter between the the Anglo-Saxon and more the, maybe the, I would say the Latin uh, approach to personalism because I think there is somehow a disconnect somehow because the, the author that he mentioned I never heard of well, he, who wrote <laughs> on personalism in bioethics. So it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, according to, I guess, the Catholic approach, uh, it's very much centered on person, but the person viewed in a very special way. Okay, not in a phenomenological way, not from an experiential way, even those are important, but mostly uh, from a metaphysical way. I only three minutes left. Okay. <laughs> oh, well. Okay. Um, so, metaphysics, um, that's the whole approach from, I guess, uh, St. Thomas interpreting Aristotle. And so, those questions basically would look at what life is, when, the last, when life begins, human life, and then question of embryos and brain death. Um, so once again, the soul and the body are not two things, but it's a unit. Human beings are made of body and souls. That's why the emphasis on the soul or the spiritual dimension uh, is very important. So salvation or health is not basically just physical health. Um, and this dimension of the body and soul in some way impact on our sexuality, okay? And so, in some way, that's why I, I think when you look at the Catholic approach to um, these issues, a lot of questions come about, especially in the, in the point, the more thorny issues of uh, sexuality in terms of um, contraception, infertility treatment, and so on. So, can't go into that, I have only two minutes. Um, and then, <laughs> once again, um, the person is also, once again, not just uh, isolated, also a person living in um, community. So um, the, the approach is that um, um, we have, or human beings have, the uh, possibility to, um, to know the truth and to act freely, okay? and, but yet 
uh, that truth implies, that, that, that freedom implies responsibility and implies a certain not selfish, you know, just, just what I decide. You know, it's also community based and so um, solidarity sort of based. Um, in some way, um, what we see uh, today in terms of Catholic healthcare is that um, I guess one center way to, I mean, looking at the person would be that um, it's a person of Christ. Christ is both the healer and the patient. So, in some way, um, Catholic way of looking at the personhood is somehow to see God in the patient, okay, and then also see God in the healer, okay. So, when we heal, we are acting somehow in the person of Christ. So, the um, spiritual dimension comes out in that um, in that um, we are, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, well, maybe I end, end over there. Okay, thank you.